Welcome to the first vocabulary video. Your first word this week is status quo, which is a Latin word meaning the existing condition or state of affairs. Basically, it means you want things to stay the same. For example, we have, I don't like the changes proposed and would prefer to maintain the status quo. Basically, you want to keep things as they are. In an election year, to vote for the party that's in control would be to vote to maintain the status quo, whereas to vote for the other opponent would be to vote for something new. So the status quo would be keeping things as they are. Coup d'etat is the next word. And this is a French word meaning a sudden decisive exercise of force in politics. This is especially when in it's referring to a violent overthrow or alteration of an existing government by a small group. We've seen many, many coup d'etats over the century. There were several in South and Latin America um, over the past probably 15 to 20 years ago. And more recently within um, North Africa and the Middle East in what was called the Arab Spring, which started about a year and a half ago, we've seen several coup d'etats where a small group is able to overthrow the government, usually because the government is unjust, but sometimes you'll see the bad group actually being the ones to overthrow the government. This next word is a French term. It's a word that we actually don't have a word for in English, so we have to kind of go to other languages if we want to get a word for it. The word is silage, and I'm not sure I'm exactly pronouncing that right. My pr French pronunciations are lacking. And this is a trail of scent left behind by a perfume. So we've all smelled this before. So in the example sentence, the boy was wearing so much axe that a silage remained in the room for several minutes after he left. So this can be a good thing if it's a pleasant scent, and especially if it's not overpowering, but it can also be not so good if it is something that's extremely strong. You could also say this about non-perfumed items. So for example, if anyone has been in the wrestling room in the middle school, or the old gym, after wrestling practice, there is a definite silage of sweat. Your next word is hubris. And this is excessive pride or self-confidence or arrogance. So this isn't just the regular pride of having done something well and taking pride in your work. This is something where it's taken to an extreme and usually where there's going to be some sort of downfall or you're putting yourself at risk for something to happen. So we have a couple good examples of hubris within mythology. The first would be Achilles, who thought he was invincible, for his mother had taken him and dipped him within the waters of the river Styx, basically making him invincible to any damage by or harm through battle. But the one part that was left uncovered was his heel when his mother dipped him into the waters, and that was a part of vulnerability for him. And so when he was shot in the heel, he died as a result. Many people, looking back at the story of Achilles, have seen this kind of as a karma or some sort of retribution for his hubris as he kind of mocked the others in the Battle of Troy with all of his victories. Another example of hubris would be Icarus, who had wings made out of feathers and wax that he was going to use to fly out of Crete and escape. But despite his father's warning, he decided to fly too close to the sun. And as a result, the wax in his wings melted and he fell into the sea and drowned. So he thought because he could fly, he's just going to tempt fate instead of just simply doing his task. He needs to go close to the sun because, well, he can and as a result he died. The next word is onus. This is a difficult or disagreeable obligation, task, burden, etc. It's also a burden of proof or a blame or responsibility. 
The way I typically hear this is in, term of, in terms of responsibility or obligation. So for example, if you are absent, the onus is on you to get your makeup work. And that's typically the way I hear the phrase used. The onus is on blank, and then you can fill in the noun. So this is going to be used to represent or in reference of when someone has a responsibility for to do something. This next word is one of my favorites. It's schadenfreude. Another word that English does not have a word to encapsulate this feeling. And this is satisfaction or pleasure felt at someone else's misfortune. Now this can get kind of sick where there's people who enjoy watching other people be tortured, but this can also be more of a taking joy in kind of a karma situation where someone's done something pretty bad and then something bad happens to them as a result and you kind of are happy about that. So for example, everyone in the cafeteria applauded when the bully was punched in the face. For while they knew violence was bad, they experienced schadenfreude at the karma of this situation. So basically, someone was doing something bad, bad things happened to them as a result, they got what they deserved kind of situation. Homage is the next word, and this is respect or reverence paid or rendered. The formal public acknowledgement by which a feudal tenant or vassal declared himself to be the man or vassal of his lord, owing him much felty and service. This one really isn't used that much, being that we don't live in a feudal system. But if you read historical novels, you might see this referenced. So it's not necessarily archaic, it's just not relevant to our time period. It's also the relation thus established of a vassal to his lord, and again, not current for our language now, but something you'll certainly see studying anything historical. And this is also something done or given in acknowledgement or consideration of the worth of another. Uh, and so this would be something to recognize someone for their greatness or for something kind that they've done for you. So the portrait was painted as an homage to the queen. You might write a poem for your boyfriend or your girlfriend. So something done to honor, respect, or thank someone else. Edification is moral improvement or guidance. So contrary to what you guys think about your parents lecturing you just to annoy you, they also have a bigger purpose. And that's that they're responsible for your edification and trying to make sure you grow up to be a responsible adult. So it's up to your parents and other adults around you to help make sure that you've got this guidance so that you can be a positive contributing citizen rather than someone ending up in jail. And then we have extrapolate. This is, means to infer from something that is known. So you're making some sort of conjecture or educated guess. It's the other definitions would be to estimate outside the tabulated or observable range or to estimate to values outside the known range, which are basically the same thing as the first one. So you'll be hearing a lot of polls and so and so's ahead four points or two points or they're dead even in the polls over the next few weeks. And polls that estimate who will win the election are conducted by surveying a small number of people and then extrapolating those results to the general population. Clearly they can't survey everyone. But if you take a sample population, so one that's going to be characteristic of the general population, so you get enough people who are minorities, who are women, who are men, etc. And then you can take what they say and you can extrapolate that to the general population with a fair amount of degrees of success. Our last word is sans, and this just means without. So her mother told her to come home from the party sans friends, or without friends, for they had plans in the morning. This will also be used in reference to things like fonts. You might have heard of serif fonts and sans serif fonts. The difference is, if you look at the image, sans serif fonts have no little, I don't know, really how to describe it, but little 
knob thingies at the end. So if you look at the example at the bottom in red, you'll see that there's extra little lines going on the serif fonts, whereas the sans serif fonts lack those. So basically, the fonts are just those with serifs, and sans serif means those without.